podcast now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to a special common webinar, Lender SBA Oversight 2022. You're in for a treat. Brent Cherlino wrote the book on lender oversight. Leslie Tripp wrote the book on how to comply with Brent's book. And Chuck, I don't know what you're doing here, but you're looking good as always. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Good intro. Uh, um, and and um, let's see, Brent is the executive vice president and chief credit officer with Blue Foundry Bank. And he was with SBA for four years, um, going coming up through the ranks as um, civil service, right, Brent? Yeah, I was in private sector for a bit, but I came over from FDIC where I was appointed and then I got the gig over at SBA in 2012. Brent, Brent was Gene, with the one. Gene Hewlett, my, my favorite oh, boss ever. Yeah, it's Gene. Um, and uh, is very instrumental in the Paris scores, risk-based compliance strategies. Uh, what we are all facing as an industry, you can thank Brent there. How's <laughs> I probably probably should market this better here. <laughs> um, and Leslie is the with Garcia and Ortiz. Uh, tell me a little bit about them, Leslie. Uh, let's see. Garcia and Ortiz is a tax and accounting firm located in St. Petersburg, uh, Florida. Uh, we also have a separate consulting department and we specialize in SBA consulting. Um, for a while, uh, Garcia and Ortiz had the contract to um, help Okram audit the banks and SBA lenders. Um, and now a new small business has that contract. Um, anyway, I've been uh, a senior examiner for the FDIC um, and some other stuff in my past, but uh, Garcia and Ortiz is, is uh, very focused in SBA uh, compliance. Yeah, and obviously you're an expert in this field in terms of compliance for the lenders, specifically SBA. You've done a lot of work in that area. I Chuck have. Evans has been in the industry for longer than me, which is good news. <laughs> He's with uh, Windsor Advantage, a loan service provider that provides hands-on, boots on the ground. Uh, I don't want to say consulting because that's the wrong word. Uh, what's what's the right word, Chuck? What what services do you provide? Processing, for closing, and servicing for, for, for community lenders. But we are passionate about what these two do. So that's that's why I'm sitting here. It's a, my oh, my dear. first job in 2007 when we introduced a LSP or external controls made life easy for everyone. So oh, I'm a firm believer in what Leslie does. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stop talking here after I go over the house rules. This is recorded. We will be sending out the link to everyone. Um, and obviously Brent and Leslie do not have any issues as well as Chuck that you may send this to whoever you want uh, if they are involved with risk-based reviews of your institution. Please download these certificates. This does count when you're asked for what you're doing for additional training and you may download that. Um, you can adjust the webcam, obviously. And as I said, if you get attacked by the Gremlins and you go offline, we will have this recorded. And with that, um, there's a certificate of participation. And with that, Brent, I believe you are uh, leading off. Uh, tell us what's yeah. coming in 2022. Well, thanks, Bob, and I appreciate it. And good morning and good afternoon uh, across the country to all the various locations and lenders out there that have tuned in. Um, I've been subject to a, a number of discussions, calls, questions um, within the industry over the last four months, maybe the last few years since PPP, but I thought um, it'd be productive and constructive to put together, uh, you know, what I'll call a state of the union on where the industry might be for oversight uh, and perspective on oversight and regulatory now that we are pivoting out of PPP and transitioning back to uh, conventional 7A uh, program operations. Um, if I use an, ana an analogy, it might be like, you know, one of those 
uh, HBO shows that um, was had a, had an 18 month hiatus, and now you're coming back for the last season or the next set of seasons. Um, but we need to realize that PPP drew a lot of attention, created a lot of attention, drew a lot of attention, and diverted a lot of attention. Um, and now all of a sudden we have to get back to a normal situation. So where did the miniseries leave off back in 2020 before PPP, um, you know, emerged much like other, you know, financial and, and disruptive crises? And, um, and now look at our general uh, economic conditions and who are the constituents that have emerged both from oversight and regulatory um, and, and what's their perspective. Uh, and they all have a unique perspective and I can talk from personal experience over the last couple of years having dealt with and I'm going to give you the alphabet. We've got SBA in the Oprah, Office of Credit Risk Management. We have SBA IG, which is tuned up as a result of, of the IG. I mean, as a result of PPP. We have the GAO that's out there for fraud, waste, and abuse. We have the SBA Hill committees investigating all kinds of things. We also now have in a very keen interest from the FDIC, and I'm in an FDIC regulated institution and just went through the exam cycle and SBA was, which where it used to be a sidecar is now a main car. The OCC um, is also, uh, I went through a series of audits with them with Patriot Bank where I was on the board in 2019 and 220. The NCUA and the increased uh, participation by the credit unions um, is now looking at SBA um, as its own, um, you know, uh, major area of diversity for the for the credit unions. And we have the Fed from a holding company standpoint that's looking at SBA and SBA lending and SBA lenders. So again, I'm speaking from my own experience. I thought that during the past couple of years might help to contextualize where SBN lenders should be thinking uh, as we come out of this um, out of this last two years. Um, I've stood up two SBA divisions. Um, I'm this, you know, I've been a senior risk officer of SBLCs and non-bank lenders. I was on the board of a national bank um, which had OCC audits. I've gone through multiple SBA loan reviews and safety and soundness exams. I've undergone the OCC exams, the FDIC exams, and then Federal Reserve reviews. Consequently, I suggested to a number of folks, um, why don't we um, incorporate someone that's also doing the internal loan reviews and one of the big largest um, LSPs out there, which is Windsor, who's also been specializing in data with Windsor with over 80 customers and put together a, a good perspective from the attend for these attendees. So hey Brent, let me interrupt uh, you for a second. I sure, want to, I always yeah. love doing this. This just in the Fed raised the rate a half a point. Well, that's less than I thought. So no good. Surprise. Interesting. So, so um, so in this lender oversight, it's why, who, what, and how. What's what's going to be increased compliance scrutiny for 2022? Who's going to be in scope? What can you expect and how can you prepare? So if we could go to the next screen, um, I put in there the State of the Union and I wanted to go through a quick legislative and reg and SOP history. If you go to the bottom and look at September 2006 is the last time that the SOP 5100 or the lender oversight was, was um, amended and issued. And if you go to the top, as we understand it from SBA, 5100 is, is under construction and should come out and it should finally reflect the Paris metrics and Paris protocols. In December of 2014, we had the Paris methodology that came out when myself and Gene Hewitt were there. And then in June of 2018, we had the Small Business 7A Lender Oversight Reform Act, 
And then after that in September, we had the fee disclosure and compensation agreement, which also talked about loan agents and LSPs. And then we had in 2000, in, later in September, the regulatory information notice. And then as of June of 2019, there was implementation of that 7A lender oversight reform act which gave enforcement powers officially to SBA then in March of 5th March of 2020 we had the cares act come out with PPP mm -hmm. and then in October we had 5106 come out um, which is a new SOP and then as of January 2021 the new 5053 which is supervision and enforcement um sop was done prior to doing 5100 they snuck that in on us in 2021 and now we're probably in the process of waiting to see 5100 and just put that all in context of the increased scrutiny that's been drawn on sba based on you know the amounts of money and the, and the public service it did and um you know having gone through this with fdic before you know, sometimes no good deed goes unpunished. So I think that there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on SBA to, you know, revamp and re-ramp up their oversight. So with that, let's go to the next one, which is the road ahead. What's the impact of the new SOP? What's the impact of supervising enforcement powers that were given to SBA formally? What's the impact of new regulatory interest by the FDIC and OCC? And what's post PPP COVID and the expiration of the subsidy payments? What's what are people looking at the regulators and other constituents uh, as given that we have usually a one quarter delay in the information that comes out from 1502 and our um, the financial service um, processor, and then what's ahead post COVID economy? What's our portfolio quality performance going to look like, which uh, not only is the subsidy going away, but now we have Fed increases and in inflation. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more concern over the quality of the SBA portfolio. And then with all the scrutiny, how do these regulatory and SBA groups leverage themselves? And I think that self-assessment and self-assessment reviews is an important part. The more you can do for yourself to prove that you're monitoring yourself, the more leverage you'll get out of that and potentially impress your regulators, whether it be SBA or non-SBA, FDIC, that you're on top of your portfolio and you're on top of your quality control and you're, you know, you're on top of your procedures. What's borrower performance going to be and how are you monitoring that? And is there going to be increased supervision by SBA, FDIC, and OCC? So moving on to the next one, um, I wanted to do a little bit of a, a data review. Back in the day when I was at SBA, we, we, I pulled some of these numbers from the latest uh, SBA presentations, the national lender profile, and then some peer group information but here's kind of the profile of banks we've got 1168 active banks out of 4200 we got 125 credit unions out of 5300 both what's that change the oh, slide. can you change the slide please i'm sorry um and then we have 58 um community advantage lenders and they're reinstituting that program so hopefully there'll be additional participants and then we have 22 non-bank lenders which includes the 14 sblcs um and so that gives you a profile of what the active lenders are meaning that normally they're doing more than four to five loans a year if we go to the next slide i wanted to do a comparison um to show you where 2016 versus 2021, so five years later, using the data that's come out um, from um, SBA's uh, FOIA information, you can see the change in the size, the portfolio from around 68 billion to 133 billion, but you can also see that the 
institutions greater than 350 million have almost tripled. You're up from 32 to 82. And you can see that the 100 million to 350 million have gone from 78 to 134. That's doubled. Um, and, and you can kind of see that, that from a standpoint of, of institutions are getting larger. If we go to the next slide, I wanted to show, look at, looked at it by the number of dis, um, disbursements that lenders are doing. And you can see those making more than 50 disbursements per year has pretty much doubled. And there you can see some of the general volumes. So these, these numbers aren't exactly perfect, but they are, they do come from the FOIA databases that both uh, Windsor Advantage has had and that Coleman has had and, and are available, but it gives you a little bit of a context. We used hey, to get Brent, a bounce. Hey, yes. Real, real quick, because of PPP, I think we're going to see an influx of new lenders that haven't booked loans, that they're just getting over PPP. So this, this is, these are the active lenders, but there's a tremendous amount, at least I think, of lenders that are just getting into it. So more to come. Well, what it does show you is there's, a, there's, there's, it's not, it's going to be hard for these regulators to cover all of the new, you know, additional right. lenders, bigger lenders. So they're going to, you know, I think SBA is going to try to leverage and do more target reviews and smaller uh, loan sample reviews. Plus, they're doing their delegated or de delegated authority or desk reviews. But that means, like, again, a, a case for, um, doing more self-assessment uh, yep. as part of your, you know, risk management and part of your own over internal oversight. So if we go to the next screen, um, what will this bring? What's the increased compliance scrutiny? So what's coming up if we go to the next screen? Um, again, we got increased supervision based on um, on the bottom right, you'll see that SBA loans as a concentration level are being considered by FDIC, OCC, and the NCUA. And also the Consumer Finance Protection Board is having more influence on FDIC and OCC and what's going on in small business. Also, SBA has become an important part of CRA. It always has been, but it's as, as CRA becomes more an important, important issue, particularly under this administration, um, SBA becomes very important. And what role will SBA loans have in CFPB's future? Um, we have on the left side, the SBA's new regs, powers, and SOP um, combined with an increased scrutiny of SBA by, by the Hill constituents and the public. And then increase 7A loan volumes, we've seen even as of yesterday or the day before, the administrator asking for additional funding in the 2023 budget. And then on the right, we've got a, a, a much changing economic environment. Um, we've got, you know, interest rate up, we've got the sunsetting of PPP, and we've got where are we in the economic cycle. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to take a moment to go through the Lending Oversight and Reform Act of 2018. And what that really did is it gave OPRAM uh, and the Lender Oversight Committee, which is the committee within um, the Office of Capital Access that makes enforcement decisions, um, that they can imp they can put an imposition of a portfolio ceiling as a formal action. They there's suspension from selling to the secondary market. There's suspension or revocation of delegated authority. There's suspension from SBA loan program participation. There's civil money penalties up to two hundred and fifty thousand, and there's debarments. And yes, there is an appeals, and so how can how, you can now appeal enforcement actions? And there's a process for doing that. Can we go to the next slide? Um, the next slide then says you can uh, formal and informal enforcement actions from lenders that do not comply with the SBA rules. There's also informal actions. So you can get an SBA supervisory letter, a mandatory training requirement, board resolution or commitment letter, 
and then voluntary actions and SBAs use voluntary actions a lot to get lenders to comply and they can come from and, and be promulgated from different aspects of your performance. And there is also um, new wording in the credit elsewhere um, for the new legislation to seek and update and modernize SBA foundation test of, uh, of eligibility where the new definition of credit elsewhere re realigns the test to ensure it's based on borrower's ability to obtain credit rather than a lender's ability to offer the credit. Meaning it's not just what your policies are, it's also could the borrower have gotten credit. And you know, those of you who've gone through reviews, the credit elsewhere test is, in, is becoming more and more important as a fairness issue. That's hot, hot button. Do you, do you think that they'll have the personal resource test brought back like they had two years ago? You know, I don't, I don't know what's going on in that area. May, Nagel may have a better idea of yeah. that. Uh, I guess I'll, I don't profess to know that. Leslie, I don't know if you're hearing anything on the front lines with that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure either. And I would say, like you just said about Nagel, um, we do see a, a number of lenders who are not 100% in compliance with the credit elsewhere test because it's so specific. Um, so anyway, yeah. But it's still, you know, it is a hot button because it's a, yeah. it's also a fairness inequity issue. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next slide, which mm -hmm. is 5053 supervision and enforcement. So we've got enforcement powers, corrective actions, penalties, quality controls, program documentation, and independent loan reviews. Um, I, I just find it the reason I'm focusing on this is this is what SBA chose to choose as a priority during the pandemic to codify and then make sure that a new SOP came out. So that should give you an indication that, you know, they're serious about what they're going to be reviewing. And by that seriousness, the other regulators have gotten serious about looking at their SBA portfolios, meaning FDIC and OCC. So if we go to the next slide, um, what's likely to be issued when 5100 comes out? You know, um, when is it likely to be issued? I guess that could be impacted by external factors. It could be impacted by the IG and the GAO. I think there's been some discussion about a September, end of September, end of this fiscal year time period. I'm sure we'll learn some more at Nagel and are what are likely to be, you know, the key features. And that would be the utilization of the LLMS uh, risk management portal and the metrics. So I suggest everyone get real familiar with the portal. In fact, now when you download off the portal, it actually says a desk review where it used to be um, uh, an LPA, a lender profile assessment. And I've seen those some of the terminology change. And then there'll be further refinement of the Paris review protocol standards, guidance and methods. So what's the impact? I think an increased reliance on self-assessment type of activities, um, working with your internal audit departments and the use of independent loan reviews, whether they're third party or within your organization, a non-affiliated review group. Or <clears throat> it's hard sometimes for your LSP to do that. They can do a quality control review and they can work with helping to assist with the independent loan review, but their, their key feature is what's the quality of their uh, internal quality control because they're, you know, performing those functions for you. And all the more reason maybe to use someone like Leslie simply because that's an external control where you're giving the LSP keys to the car, so to speak, and this is a good good control if you're using one. Well, it's one of the first questions I keep getting whenever um, the, a regulator comes in to see me is they're giving me a list of requests, just like SBA does. And they're saying, what are you doing in turn? What are your internal risk mitigation controls? And are they are they a third party within your own bank or if they're a third party from outside? And in my case, I've had to have Leslie's done a review and then I had internal audit do it and to, and just to make you kind of interesting and a plug that our 504 contractor, which used to be Mercadian at um, SBA actually had to do my 
review of my review. So it's a small world out there in the SBA oversight world. Um, so on oversight monitoring enforcement, um, what's the mission for OPRM? What's the oversight tools and what's the direction? Um, if we go to the next slide, the mission of, of, of OPRM, which you, you can see in their presentations, is the mission of, of credit risk management is to ensure the integrity and maximize the effectiveness of the SBA's lending program by managing portfolio risk, monitoring the lender performance, and enforcing lender lending program requirements. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll show the Paris Protocol and you can see what PARIS stands for, what the best benchmark categories are, what the review assessments are, and then the types of reviews. So these are the kind of things that we'll see starting to be codified within the new 5100. Um, if you go to the current 5100, you don't see these protocols laid out. So I'm trying to make sure if there's new lenders out there, they become familiar with what PARIS means, um, how they're using the, the, the Paris metrics and then the types of reviews. And I anticipate from listening to a, a couple of the recent conferences that um, Oakram wants to do a number of more target reviews and, and really utilizing the delegated authority and desk review so that they can screen through and really target um, you know, attributes that they're seeing in lenders, not necessarily doing a comprehensive review, but targeting in on areas that might be higher risk and not necessarily having to do the whole comprehensive review other than if you're a Mac, mega large lender. We go to the next slide. Um, this just gives you the overall um, kind of context of what's you know a good pair score, what's a moderate risk pair score, what's a higher risk pair score, and then what the risk profiles are. And then I made note of the desktop review report and the delegated authority and utilizing the one and two year renewals as part of oversight monitoring. And sometimes they'll utilize a quarterly delegated authority or a half year delegated authority. So they've been using delegated authority as a, ma as a management tool for oversight. We go to the next one, what, who's gonna be in scope? So how does the SBA look at, um, what are the risk assessment factors? So let's go to the next screen. And we have pair score, time since the last risk-based review, your prior risk-based uh, review assessment, your delegated authority, or if you've never been reviewed, and then at what size do you start to come on to the screen for SBA to look at? And usually that's between, let's say, four to eight million. And once you get above, definitely above eight million, you start to kind of, get on this radar of SBA. And I don't know if you've had any experience with that, Chuck, being that you have, you know, what, over 80 lenders um, and you you help start them off, like you've helped me a couple of times start up SBA departments. We're really not on the radar until we at least get over four or 5 million in loans. No, but we try to get our lenders prepared for it as, as so it's not a surprise when they hit eight or ten million dollars and and certainly support them as best we can as best the SBA will allow us when the, when the reviews come in. So so SBA does an annual risk as they do an annual risk profile analysis and they look at portfolio growth, loan agents use, public documents, lender service provider use, and LPA benchmark. So there is a process behind the scenes for them mm -hmm. to try to determine what their scope is going to be for reviews. Um, and they usually do that in the summer. So they've probably looked through and decided what they're going to do for 2022. But soon in the next 90 days, they'll start looking at what 2023 is going to be looking like. And that's probably will be a more important year as they've come out of PPP and can focus more back on, you know, the conventional program. So if we go to the next screen, we'll see um, here are some uh, a list of risk filter flags, and they use these flags, which is higher pair of scores, your lender purchase rating of four or five portfolios greater than four million, um, large lenders without a risk-based review in the last two fiscal years large lenders was marginally or less than acceptable risk-based review results. 
uh, SBA lending concentrations greater than 49%, uh, five-year net cash flow negative. That is something that you'll, so if you've been a net contributor to SBA as an insuring company versus costing them based on your active purchases, um, do you have a two-year growth rate of greater than 50% or a two-year growth rate of greater than 20%? Um, do you have a pair score that's deteriorated? So has it increased? Do you have more than 50 loans in active default for more than three years? Significant secondary market participation, more than four risk groups present on, these, on the risk flags and SBA experience less than three years. So just giving you some ideas as to the different factors that they look at in setting up the scope for, for the various types of reviews. And Brent, if you can do some things, some proactive things to improve this, if you open up the lender portal for the first time and you find it's a little bit surprising, there's some things that you can really get proactive with to change these. Yes. And, and and I don't know if a lot of how deep in an, in, an, in a lender organization the staff be, is familiar with what's coming sure. out of the lender portal, but that We're should not. be something shared on a quarterly basis with the whole team. Yeah. Because and we'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about what the what some of the portal looks like, and the less they, and, and you guys can talk about it. But it's a really great tool, and it's great for talking to your risk department and your internal audit department. If we go to the next screen, it's um, what's coming in 2022, what can you expect? So let's go to the next screen. You're gonna have a catch up from 2021 on PPP. You're gonna have a heavy reliance on desktop and delegated authority reviews. There's gonna be uh, a lot of looking at the lender portal, LLMS data and the data pack. And if you've never pulled the data pack, it has a, a really lot of information and it can go back eight quarters. So you can see trends, whether it's SBPS scores or other risk factors that are within Paris. Um, there's a new Okram audit contractor that was awarded, Williams Adley, and, um, and they're a, a Washington-based uh, uh, disadvantage for small business. Um, they, they did a lot of work at, SP, at FDIC when I was there. Um, of course, Garcia was the first contractor under the Paris, and then um, they were succeeded by Williams Adley. Um, uh, Okram Alliance on Contract Reviewers and then self assessment and internal reviews that you can provide to SBA or the other regulators. We can go to the next uh, screen. How should you prepare now? And I'm so I want to talk a little bit about the self-assessment. I can't reinforce enough the lender portal, the LLMS Paris metrics, and the reports that can come out of your part, portal, and really understanding of slicing and dicing your data pack. That's what the reviewers that review you at SBA are going to use. They're going to use the data pack. That's what that's what you know Eddie Ledford and his crew are going to do. They're going to look at those data packs. Um, and then they're gonna look at your internal quality control process, what your post-closing review process is, and then are you using any kind of independent uh, loan review, whether it's an internal loan review department or a third party outside. We could go to the next. Um, so uh, focusing in on the self-assessment, self lender know thyself. So you got the lender portal monitoring, you got the loan review protocols, you got quality control structure, and then you have training. So those are, um, you know, all areas that that I've been asked questions on, both from SBA and from uh, FDIC and, and OCC. And to give you a little snapshot, uh, if we go to the next screen, um, there are tolerance levels. This is an old version of the snapshot, but this is. Um, where the Paris Lender Portal gives you a snapshot or dashboard, and then there are tolerance levels there about what's preferred and acceptable uh, and less than acceptable. And so you should get to know what those ranges are so you know within your data pack and your um, desk review that you can download off your portal where you stand. And here's an example of some of the risk flags and what the tolerance levels are that keep it green or red. 
So again, I'm, I guess what I'm doing here is trying to get you into the awareness business that there's this whole set of tools that you pay for with your LLMS fees that make it really, um, you know, practical to manage and know where you are from a risk profile standpoint. If we go to the next um, screen, uh, we've listed out what some of the detail is on the data pack and Leslie will talk a little bit about the data pack. If we go to the next screen, this is what current, at least uh, the last known current visuals are based on your lender risk framework. And you can see the Paris on the left and then where you are as a lender as a result. And it gives you a comparison to your peer group. So you can see you know, where you lay out. The next screen gives you your vintage analysis. So you can see what's happening based on um, you know, your vintage years of origination. And they're gonna be watching this closely to see what starts happening with loans. You know, I gave what was pulled off of the web, um, but they're gonna be looking at 218, 219 and start seeing if there's trends there because there's always a lag effect as to vintages and when you start to see active purchase, um, particularly with the 18 month, you know, um, but they're also looking at high risk originations um, and tracking high risk originations and early defaults. And if we go to the next screen, we'll, we'll, this screen will show you, you know, here you can see the lender risk rating, lender purchase rating, special items that they're looking at, delegated authority. And, but important on this one is what's your SBPS ranges, the five ranges and where do your loans fit in on a, on a low to high scale, and is that trend changing? So are you going here from, you know, a 10% or so for this particular specimen, do you start to get up to 15% or 20% that would be in that SBP, S range of, um, you know, 159 and below? So we go to the next screen, it's um, on independent loan reviews. How will SBA use those? What's the scope? What's the benefit and challenges? And what are the tools? So if um, we go to the next screen, the heart of SBA compliance audits is the, is the um, target reviews and the full reviews. And SBA is moving toward increasing reliance on self-initiated or independent loan reviews. And guidance issues to SBLCs will also likely be adopted for across the board on 7A. And I know Paul, Kerwin, for instance, has developed things. He's now supervising SBLCs, but he's developed things for the CDCs, like internal loan controls and governance guidance that really helps on the 7A side. And I don't know if you, you want to add in anything here, Leslie, as to um, how you've seen uh, in, in responses to loan reviews? Um, well, one thing I'd like to mention is the uh, a couple of slides ago, a number of slides where you were talking about the Paris benchmarks review and the data pack. I found that probably 30% of our customers don't even know what that is and they've never yes. seen it or used it or pulled it. Uh, and if anyone is on this call and is in that same situation, it's so useful to have that. Uh, information is very helpful to your organization. Uh, it helps you figure out what the SBA sees for your portfolio. So I would encourage you to figure out how to get access to that uh, these reports and utilize them every quarter. Yeah, we had also offered, I mean, I, we had talked about this with Bob too. If, if you want to follow up, you know, free um, demonstrate or broadcast like this just about um the lender portal and the lms reports i think we could put something together if, you know we could shoot something to bob to see if there's interest but um, i think it's needed brent because a lot of yeah. people we talk to they just go what at the, well, the, other, yeah. the other thing i found yeah. is usually have one one access person yeah. within the sba organization and they don't realize that every they, they should be pulling it out and having a group meet yeah, yeah. so it stays you know siloed within this one or two people. And if that person leaves, then, you know, you have to re-delegate the access. Or doesn't share and nobody knows about it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Um, but those pictures you saw before on those prior screens, those are all on your your um, portal when you go in and you can see all these metrics and the fancy colored graphs and the data and you can pull your data back down in Excel. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think um, the current SBA guidance on independent loan reviews, I just wanted to indicate, you know, there's 5010-6, there's the independent loan review guide from October 2017. If you go into Google and just put SBA um, independent loan review, this will come up. This is a document, I believe, that um, Paul Kerwin helped put together, um, who's one of the Oak Room officers. And then there's an internal controls guide that was done in 2016. It does apply to CDCs, but it's useful for SBA departments when they're coming in and it helps give guidance as to what SBA thinks about independent loan reviews and what they think about internal controls and governance. If we can go to the next slide, um, the requirement that IRL guidelines be documented in, in a lender's internal control policy, the frequency they like to see is some kind of annual independent review. What is the qualifications of the reviewers? What's the definition of independence? And what's the scope of the review? And that document provides 12 defined areas, which you know you can look at that document. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that there are seven specific requirements of the independent loan reviews. There's core analysis requirement, risk rating requirements by loan, and quality classification standards. There's contractor oversight, and that can also mean your third party um, LSP oversight or your third party management, which in the bank would be, you'd have two layers. You have you managing your LSP and then you have your vendor management people saying, how are you managing this vendor? Then uh, training standards, which has seemed to be more important as we have a number of, of aging people like myself and Chuck, uh, you know, departing the industry, where are we getting new, fresh uh, training um, for staff? So, you know, seeing a lot of uh, SBA groups um, having a challenge finding quality people. So you're having to bring them in and reinvest in training again, which used to be part of the normal process. And then what's the role of your board of directors in the oversight of your SBA program? Um, with that, I'm going to let's go to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to um, Leslie to talk about what she's finding from the front lines. Okay, uh, thank you, Brent. Um, so I just wanted to share some lessons from the field. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, in the past, uh, Garcia and Ortiz was the contractor for the SBA, as I mentioned already. We did that. Um, we did a huge amount of reviews from uh, 2014 and 15 and forward. Uh, and since then, we've done reviews directly for um, banks and SBLCs. Uh, so we've reviewed probably 15,000 loans total in our um, tenure for doing that. Um, we use standard methodology for doing an annual loan review or a post-closing loan review. Uh, and what I mean by that is we try to follow the, um, we try to model our reviews similar to how the SBA performs a review. Uh, we will find low risk items, which are technical items like not completing a form properly, as well as higher risk items. Uh, eligibility issues, credit underwriting, and so on. And we'll identify these uh, items to you as we're reviewing the loans, which is what the SBA does when they're reviewing you. Um, we use a system called, uh, that we've developed called Go Loan. This system is uh, our system that we use internally when we're reviewing the loans, um, but we also allow lenders to uh, utilize the system to help ensure that their 7A loans are in compliance with the SOP. Um, and I'll share a few go loan screens uh, later on. Um, in the past, the SBA, FDIC, OCC, and NCUA are some of the agencies that Garcia and Ortiz has performed some work for. 
Um, Joe, if you can go to the next slide, please. On the front lines, what are we seeing? Uh, the first bullet point there is from page 182 of the SOP, uh, of SOP 6. We are finding that about 95% of lenders that we are reviewing are not doing this disclosure. This requirement was actually an SOPK, but it's had a lot more discussion now for the rules. And the loan file needs to contain uh, documentation informing the borrowers that the use of an agent for packaging or referring a loan is not required. Um, so again, this is just something to notate because we've noticed that a lot of lenders are not doing this until we uh, review them and then they start doing this. Uh, the next bullet point is a requirement um, that involves the purchase or renovation of a property or site. The SBA lender must conduct due diligence to determine whether the property is listed on the NRHP. Um, that's the National Register of Historic Properties. This requirement has been out in prior SOPs. However, uh, most of the lenders, again, that we are reviewing are not documenting this properly uh, as the SOP 6 words it a little differently. So um, just keep that in the back of your mind that you need to provide the due diligence in the loan file. You can't just say, oh, it's on the appraisal because that uh, is not sufficient. Uh, and just in the FYI, this is on page 212 of SOP 6. The next bullet point, uh, new requirement regarding IRS tax transcripts, buyer and seller's consent to use. This um, is new, and I don't think it was there prior to SOP 6. Uh, it's the IRS transcripts, permission to use and permission to share. Um, one interesting thing is the form 1919 clears the part of the requirement um, as for the borrower it's giving the borrower's consent but it doesn't clear the it does not fulfill the seller's consent to use it uh, so the and this is on um page 205 of sop 6. The lenders just need to copy and paste from 205 and create a disclosure to have the seller sign uh, with the written consent as per the SOP wording. Just copy and paste it and ensure that you're putting that in um, some sort of disclosure. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, other things that we're seeing are forms not being completed properly. This is very common, and it's what we consider a technical exception. Many times the form 1919 is not completed correctly or doesn't contain all the required attachments. That's a, a big common thing. Or that the question about the packaging fee is answered no, yet there's a packaging fee charged. Um, a bunch of different exceptions on the form 1919. Uh, same thing with the form 1920. Um, we're seeing a lot of form 1920 errors uh, and the form 1920 should be reviewed to ensure it's completed correctly and that all blanks are filled in, et cetera. Um, so Leslie, is, is the takeaway here that SBA is really looking at um, compliance with the form requirements? Is that yes. something that's been a priority to them? Yes, the SBA would love to ensure that all the lenders are completing the forms correctly. Uh, these are what's called technical exceptions. Um, I mean, when you've closed a loan and you have a form 1919 and it's not completed correctly, it's a borrower's form, so you can't really do much about it at that point. The 1920 is the lender's form, um, so the lender should be ensuring that both forms are completed correctly before the loan closes. Um, <clears throat> the next bullet point is the other things we're seeing are the loan authorization not being prepared correctly. Some errors include missing all the required insurances, um, and that would include uh, workers' comp or dram shop uh, liability insurance, or missing all items required as collateral. I mean, there's a lot of other loan authorization errors that can occur, but these are some common ones that we're seeing right now. Um, list of equipment and fixtures missing. This one is specifically from the, uh, the loan authorization boilerplate, uh, Appendix A, page A17, I think. Um, 
where it says that the lender must obtain a list of all equipment and fixtures that are collateral for the loan, including a description and serial number for units valued at 5,000 or more. So you have to have that if it's applicable in your loan file. Uh, last on this page are missing all required equity injection documentation. Um, and the, we're seeing this a little too often. Um, this one is a pretty big one. Uh, it's a very big subject. Uh, and the, the lender has to document the required injection funds. There are very specific requirements for what you need to document. And that is found on page 444 of SOP 6. Uh, it's a whole section that details exactly what has to be in the loan file. So I would encourage everyone to, if you're not clear on it, just to read it. Um, it's very specific uh, and it's all detailed there uh, and it all has to be followed there. There is no room for, um, not any real room for negotiation on the documentation required. Uh, next slide, please. Other things that we're seeing are required loan, uh, required lien positions. What we're um, looking for here is lien perfection. Uh, loan files not documented with proper perfection of all required lien positions. Now, uh, if a loan just closed, you would not expect to find a final title policy in the file, of course, but we, uh, when we are reviewing a file, either performing a post-closing review or an independent loan review, we're gonna look for evidence that the lender perfected its lien position on the collateral, including, if applicable, a post-close UCC search. Um, and that's from page 446 of the SOP. Um, accurate completion of form 1050, the next bullet point. We've found a lot of form 1050s that are not completed and or signed properly. Uh, the borrower should be signing on the original document the entire 1050 should be completed. Disbursements need to occur at the time the form is dated by the lender and the borrower, although this is not always possible in reality, but that is what the SOP states, that the uh, 1050 should be signed and dated at the time of the initial loan disbursement. Uh, SAM searches. All required SAM searches need to be in the loan file. If you are unclear as to who do you have to do a SAM search on, you should just uh, refresh your memory and look at page 170 to 171 of the SOP because it tells you exactly, it tells you a very specific list as to who is required to have a SAM, the SAM exclusion search on. Um, no site visit for a change of ownership. Uh, for a change of ownership transaction, you must document a site visit for the location being acquired. Uh, this is taken directly from page 235. You need to document the date of the visit as well as comments. Uh, let's see, at the bottom of that screen, does the department have a current business plan? Brent, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, these are just some other additional questions that are being provided uh, or being uh, sent when they ask for your request letter from SBA. Do you have a current business plan? Normally, you know, your org chart, what are your estimates for the year? Are you changing your market? Um, are you adding to your BDO group? Um, and, and a lot of people don't really have a, any kind of a formal or even a, a general business plan for their SBA department. Uh, and that's being asked for both by SBA and the other regulators. Do you, do you have a QC process flow document that um, I know for FDICIA, for FDIC regulated institutions, we got to follow FDICIA. So is there any controls in there for these for this type of loan, given that it's a government guaranteed loan? And sometimes it helps to have a process flow document. And uh, I know, I, not to give a pitch to Chuck, but he's very, they've been very good Windsor in helping between what's the process flow between um, the bank, the LSP, back to the bank, back to the LSP, back to the bank, and which things the bank can do and must do versus what you know the LSP can do uh, and facilitate. 
And then how do you interact with your internal audit or your internal loan review department? In my bank, I have both. I have an internal audit department and I have an internal loan review department. So sometimes I'm looked at twice um, and, and um, making sure I know uh, how to provide them with the SBA information and also knowing that, that there's this portal information that I can give them that really satis satisfies a lot of questions. And do you have a third party management policy and procedure for your LSPs and knowing again what they do and don't do and um, how you should interact with them? So um, those are things that uh, have been a, a, a big question that SBAs ask and so has the other regulators. Next slide, please. Uh, how does an independent SB, SBA independent loan review work? Um, as, as I've mentioned, Garcia and Ortiz can help with that. We do uh, SBA independent loan reviews for 7A loans, community advantage loans. We also uh, perform post-closing loan reviews just on a one-off if you want to ensure that you're uh, right after your loan has closed, that you've closed it properly. Um, so how do we do that? Um, first uh, thing we would try to do is evaluate the data pack uh, and the um, portal evaluation, if, if that's available. And that's what Brent was talking about um, a little bit ago. Those screens uh, were slide shots of, screenshots of these um, reports. Uh, we would determine the number of loans in the sample with the lender. Um, this is based mostly upon what the lender wants reviewed. If they just want a random sample for the past 24 months reviewed, that's fine. Uh, it, or if they have some deals specifically that they want reviewed, that's okay too, or a combination of both. So we really decide this with the lender as to how many loans to be reviewed, um, depending upon the lender's need for the review. We determine, that, we determine the range of dates closed. Um, if they've had a SBA audit uh, a year ago, there's really no point unless they have a particular loan that they need to have a, uh, another opinion on going prior to that to review other loans. So we would suggest just reviewing loans closed since the SBA review. Uh, so once we're ready to do our review and everything's agreed upon, the um, the number of loans in the sample, then the lender uploads some lo the loans to a secure site. We have reviewers who review the loans. Uh, next screen, please. We, um, after the reviewer reviews a loan, they will upload what we call an open item sheet. And that uh, de details any items that we found that were not in compliance with the SOP or something that we have a question on or something we can't find in the file. We give the lender a few days to respond to each one of these sheets, and there's one sheet for every loan. And then the reviewer um, reviews the lender response with their supporting documentation. And then we either clear the items or we, if we're not able to clear it based upon the information that the lender has provided, we tell the lender why we're not able to clear it um, and give them a suggestion as to what they need to do to correct the situation. Uh, we have a, an exit meeting with discussion about outstanding exceptions, and then we will issue a report on the results. Um, I'll just quickly go through the Go Loan review. Um, go Loan is an SBA loan compliance tool that Garcia and Ortiz has built. Um, the software basically runs through a series of questions to see if your 7A loan is in compliance with the SOP. So the first screen there, uh, here are some screenshots. So basically you enter in certain loan characteristics, um, whether it's a change of ownership or a startup. And after you pick your loan characteristics, it brings up the different questions for the loan um, in addition to the core questions. So the more, more loan characteristics you have, the more questions you're gonna have. If you have a startup and a construction and uh, you know, the more boxes you're checking there, you'll have more questions. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, after the after the loan characteristics are entered, it takes you to the questions about the loan. Um, there are forms questions. There's questions about eligibility. There's questions about loan terms, uh, credit standards, collateral, environmental, loan authorization preparation, and loan closing and disbursement, and finally servicing questions. Uh, Go loan is very helpful to train people on the SOP, as you know, training people on the SOP requirements is not very easy. Uh, next slide. They have, we have some tutorial videos in GoLoan for new users. Uh, next slide. The end product for GoLoan after you complete the loan review on a loan is this open item sheet, which I mentioned prior to. Uh, it prints out in real time with the exceptions on the loan based upon the answers that were put into GoLoan for the exception. Next slide. Uh, additionally, we have definitions within Go Loan. These are taken directly from the SOP. So if you've forgotten what, what is SBA's definition of a change of ownership, you can just quickly look it up here. Uh, next slide. We also have pro tips on many of the questions, which are just some helpful hints to the person completing the review to help them understand the question or to give them hit, hints as to what document to review in order to answer the question. Next slide. Uh, this slide so shows you the SOP, the specific SOP text for this eligibility question, and every question has this. Uh, it shows you part two, section A, chapter two, et cetera. But the most important thing here, one of the most important things, it has the SOP page number right there, which is very easy to look up things. Um, and that's it for Go Loan. Uh, next slide. Difficulties with independent loan reviews. Well, it's very time consuming. Uh, it does take effort on the lender's part because they have to have some staff to be able to answer the questions. Uh, it is disruptive depending on how many loans are being reviewed because it takes people off of their regular job. So the more prepared you are in advance uh, is better. Uh, scarce technical skills. Let's that one had to do with um, the if the people are not technical enough to be able to answer the questions of the reviewers, it makes for a very difficult review. Um, hundreds of questions slash criteria. There are hundreds of questions criteria depending. Uh, we look at maybe 150 ish. Uh, some loans are a little less, but that's how many questions we uh, are looking at um, on every loan. Inconsistent scope or level of detail. Um, the scope is very important. Uh, you need to determine what you're going to review on every loan before you start and everyone needs to be in agreement. Uh, the level of detail that we provide, I'm not sure if everyone provides this, but it's pretty detailed. Um, we don't, you, we don't, um, it, it's not just merely a post-closing review when we're doing an annual independent review. Uh, it's a thorough review of the loan file. Uh, so you would typically expect to see some exceptions or questions on every loan. Um, and that's it. Next slide. Training, Brent, I think this. Uh, yeah, how about um, Chuck and I, we'll, we'll finish this off. I'm looking at yes. the time at three or three, just um, a lot of questions these days about, are you maintaining a training log? Do you have an accurate org chart with functions? Do you have an annual training plan? And then SBA training, FDIC and OCC have been very interested in those. And I think SBA is more interested as you have turnover. Um, and then, I, you know, Chuck, of the last couple, do you have procedures that stick with your policy? And then are you working with your LSP? If you want to take a little bit of time here and. No, I think this is, this is good. And, and I, I want to go back to, to what Leslie said, because there's a tremendous amount of, of new lenders in our industry right now. And eligibility is probably the best bottleneck in a process, determining it quickly. So I think your 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 software program is an excellent tool 
especially for the new lenders that, that are not going to have the help of an LSP, maybe afford to or doesn't want to. This is a this is a great alternative. Um, we promote and and Bob has an excellent training program. But training within our industry, it's a small industry. We all work together. All of us here have participated together in training programs. But the key is is to get comfortable. The bottlenecks are eligibility determination and an efficient process. And if you can understand your your own procedures how you're working with the LSP, that's the second biggest bottleneck. And then document collection and the efficient way of collecting documents in the process is probably the third one in my opinion, so. That's that's pretty much it. The last screen um, is just uh, an overview closing, but Bob, I saw you came back on, and if you want to have any comments on training, I I can't emphasize how much the regulators are really looking at your training plans and whether you're participating in specific industry training. My, I appreciate the plug. Thank you very much. We have with Lance Sexton, we have a great uh, loan closing training. I do a loan underwriting training and that's, um, um, appreciate the feedback. We have some questions. Leslie, this is from me. Um, my head, I'm a department manager and after listening to the three of you, my head is spinning. <laughs> Give me one thing that I should go back and say, okay, I'm going to focus on this particular thing and take a look at my portfolio and my current procedures to make sure I'm doing it right. What would be the one thing that you, just the one thing that you want lenders to absolutely nail every time? Credit elsewhere uh, right now. It, it, and in order to do that, if you're unsure, you should go to the SOP and refresh your memory as to the different parts of the credit elsewhere test that have to be in your credit memo. There's more than just one part. Yeah. Um, my um, comments on that is uh, be specific and don't cut and paste. Right. Leslie, someone uh, was, is, would like some additional information, there it is, regarding how the applicant is not required to obtain or pay for packaging referring a loan application. Can you go through that a little bit more for Linda, please? Sure. That is on page 182 of the SOP. That's where the requirement is. So uh, Linda, if you just go to the page 182 of the SOP and see where it, it tells you that you have to have this disclosure, uh, and then just email me if you have a follow-up question, if you can't see what I'm talking about from 182. But again, this is one of the disclosures when we're reviewing a lender. Most lenders aren't doing this. Uh, Chuck, this is for you, from me. Um, LSP has uh, taken some big hits <laughs> in the past couple of years with a couple of the providers going to jail. Yeah. Yep. I can name two in particular. What? Give me your 30-second elevator pitch to reassure lenders that LSPs are are a good thing. And what do you do to to reassure the lenders, the the credit risk officers, and the board? It's like banks or anything else. There's good ones and there's bad ones. But today, because of the degree of regulation and due diligence that's required, it's going to probably eliminate some of the smaller mom and pops. So. As I would look at it as an L, at an LSP, make sure the due diligence is from A to Z, and, and it's very important to know who you're dealing with, and then more importantly, learn. Don't just hand them the keys to the car, because I've gone behind some of those LSPs that have worked with lenders for two or three years, and those lenders don't know any more than when they started. So the idea is to use the LSP for as long as you need to, and that could be forever, or it could be for a couple, three years. But you need to learn best practices and you need to do your due diligence just like any other vendor and don't so just I, give it to your vendor management folks you know really dive in because you're the one responsible for what we do not yeah, us the yeah, sba is going to look at you and yeah. so you need to learn every step of what we're doing why we're doing it and how we're doing it i, I was going to add know who know who really owns your lsp so there's a number of LSPs out there that have been acquired the last few years by regulated institutions, which yep. means they had to conform with a high level of compliance. Windsor is one of them, or they, they're part of a, a 
of a, of a financial holding company that's regulated. There's a few others out there too. And, you know, having been involved in a couple of those references you made from the, the, the Getchum side, um, you know, in the, it's harder and harder as an independent owner of an LSP, unless you've got the wherewithal to keep your compliance up. So part of that due diligence is know who owns what and, and what they're complying with behind the scenes. Very much so. Good, good advice. Um, Brent, what type of lender behavior would trigger enforcement? Um, I think a high, there's a number of things. First of all, high growth rate is being looked at along with high origination scores and early default rates. So, and, and probably what they're gonna start looking at is, you know, what, what is your quality control if you start growing fast, have high origination scores and or a number of early defaults. Well, I and, guess, then yes. they, and, and then they can look at things like, um, are we going to ask you to do some additional reporting? Or are they going to do some additional target reviews to make sure that you're staying, uh, your quality control is good? Because remember, SBA is an insurance company underneath it all. And so they want to make sure you're a good insurance risk. I mean, yes, they're a regulator, but basic, a government guarantee program is they want to make sure that the people they're insuring are a good insurance risk. Why is a high growth rate a huge red flag to SBA? Because it means that it, it's, a, it's a recipe for potential problems where you don't have adequate resources and capabilities to manage the amount of volume. And then if you couple that with selling to the secondary market with these That's it, you know, high premiums right now, it, it, you know, your greed takes over and so which is more important the quality or the you know the greed yeah yeah and that's and that's the key very much so um that's um joseph do we have any more questions for our esteemed panel uh no we're clear guys but the recording uh, the recording will be sent later this afternoon to everyone yeah uh, we just put up on amazon um the, if, you, if you're old school and you want a hard copy of the, of the SOP, go to Amazon Books and type in SBA SOP, and there's one that we have on, on supervision enforcement. So that's sort of a, a shameless plug for some of the new stuff that we're doing out here. Well, Fred, you'll have a new 5100 soon. There you go. All right, Bob. <laughs> um, Brent, as always, thank you very much. Chuck, it's good thank to see you. you. Leslie, great stuff as always. Uh, we appreciate it. We have the contact information. We will be sending out all these slides to everyone. And um, obviously, if you need to contact any of them, there's their contact or just drop Joseph or I an email and we'll be more than happy to forward to. Uh, thank you very much. And that concludes Thanks, today's all. webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.